Thank you, Ahmed. And we are very happy to begin uh, DeepMap 2020. The first speaker will be uh, Lenka, Professor Lenka Zvedoroba from EPFL. And uh, she's uh, done pioneering work with her colleagues in using uh, techniques developed in the statistical physics of disordered systems and using them in understanding problems in theoretical neuroscience and machine learning. Uh, and we are very excited to have her here and hear um, about her uh, recent work. Hi, I was muted and I didn't manage to unmute it while sharing the screen. So once again, now you should hear me and you should see the slide. Is that correct? Yes, we see your slides, we see you. Okay, so. awesome. Well, <laughs> Sorry for the technical trouble. Yes. So thanks again for the introduction and, and really nice to see many familiar names in the list and it would have been even so much better to be in New York with you, but okay, that's like. So today I will tell you about insights on gradient-based algorithms in high dimensional learning, something we have been working on in the past two, three years uh, with a set of uh, colleagues uh, back in Paris before, mostly before I moved to EPFL, Giulio Biroli, Cara Camarota, Florent Sakala, Pierre Francesco Urbani, Eric Weiden Aiden, and mainly to students uh, of mine, uh, Stefano Manelis Sarao, who just graduated a few weeks ago, and Francesca Miyako, who will be giving the talk just after about a follow up of what I will be telling you about. So this talk will be about gradient descent, which, you know, despite being a very simple idea that is, you know, one of the first ideas we kind of learned when we start learning about algorithms, is really the workhorse of the current revolution, um, including deep learning. It's, it's really the basic algorithm used all the time. And you know, this is very simple, it's used everywhere. And despite that, we kind of still un don't understand many things about it. So in this first slide, when you think about what we do in deep learning, uh, we have an empirical observation that actually local or even global minima with bad generalization error do exist. So there are probably many, several papers hinting towards that. The one I like uh, is the one that I am uh, citing here by uh, the group of Dimitri Akliotas, where they show with a really nice numerical experiment that indeed bad local minima, meaning generalizing badly, or global minima do exist and uh, gradient descent can reach them. So, so one needs to understand what's going on with this algorithm on much deeper level than what kind of we did so far. So the question is how do gradient based algorithms manage to avoid those bad minima with limited number of samples. So when you look at the, this question throughout literature, you often see papers uh, showing empirically or rigorously under different settings that there are no bad local minima. So I kind of crossed that uh, from my list because I think the empirical evidence that in the practical setting there actually are uh, spurious, even global minima and the algorithm just got, doesn't go there. That's kind of the, where, where I start thinking about that. So then other uh, keywords say that we see in the literature pretty much everywhere is things about implicit regularization, about uh, learning simple fun simpler functions first, etc. But at least in my point of view, none of the existing works is really giving a satisfactory answer of what's really going on in deep neural networks. So that's kind of where my motivation to dig into that question comes. So the goal is to understand the whole trajectory of gradient-based algorithms in non-convex and high-dimensional problems, because current machine learning, pretty much all of it is non-convex and high-dimensional, the input dimensions are large. So now to continue kind of to, 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 to set the mindset of this talk, uh, let me mention this, um, this note about uh, how we, think about data. So the assumption three versus, three versus models. So most practitioners in machine learning just have a fixed data set that comes from some application and want to make the method, the, the learning work on that data set. When you look, when you look at papers in, in kind of machine learning uh, today, 
large fraction of it actually evaluates their algorithms, their propositions on only a handful of data sets and you all know them, MNIST, Cypher, ImageNet. And so that's one side. The other side in the theoretical literature, most of the papers would aim to be as assumption free as possible because that's kind of the gold standard in computer science and that's kind of where we were trained and it's beautiful and it makes sense. But the drawback of this is that in this kind of worst case, this kind of worst case setting is very prone to be computationally hard. And we kind of want to understand when learning is computationally efficient and not even with any algorithm, but say more, more particularly with the gradient descent. So that's why you know, my work is set kind of in between in some middle ground that is aimed to gain more insight where we analyze generative toy models for data. And we of course need to be mindful that the toy models are relevant to the real data in the same sense that if we kind of take the more traditional theoretical approach, we need to be mindful that the worst case is relevant to the real case. And that's of course an issue. And the second point about kind of setting the mindset is a slide about when we want to prove something about the error, do we want the constants or do we want the rates? So again, in practice, we have a fixed data set and we aim to decrease the test error by sometimes even a few percent because that brings us a huge gain into a given application. So even very small changes in the constants do matter. Whereas in most of the theoretical work, we are proving bounds on the test error that might be tight in some, again, worst case sense, but that rather rarely capture the specific values of the constants for real or sometimes even for very toy cases in the case when the number of samples is limited. So again, we try to get somewhere in the middle ground to capture the constants, but to make it analyzable, tractable, again, for toy models of data. So that's how kind of, that's, that's the spirit in which I will be setting. So, so both the conclusion of both the previous slides was that we will work for toy models and try to get some insight on them. So the two toy models of data that I will be talking about today is the spiked matrix tensor model and the phase retrieval and the you know, data generated by a phase retrieval teacher with Gaussian IIT input. So I will define all that properly. And the focus is on the performance of the gradient-based algorithms. So let me start by defining this first uh, problem, the spiked matrix tensor model. So what is this as a learning problem or as an optimization problem? I define a loss function that you see above here as a function. So, so it's a function of a uh, variable X that lives on an n-dimensional sphere. And that's the variable over which I am, that I'm learning over which I will be optimizing or making the gradient with respect to this variable. And a part of the X, this loss function depends on two things, Y and T. Y is a matrix, T is a tensor. And both the matrix and tensor are created in the way that is specified here. That is, they come from an outer product of a specific vector X star plus noise, component-wise Gaussian noise with zero mean and variance that is specified by this delta two and delta P parameter. So th those are the variances of the noise. And the goal in this model is by minimizing this loss function or maybe not minimizing, but do something else. But the goal definitely is to find back the vector X star from the observations Y and T by gradient descent of the loss function. So why this model? So I repeat again, you know, this is an example of high dimensional and non-convex optimization problem. If you only had the matrix, it would be easier. If you add in the, the tensor, it's making this loss function highly non-convex. I formulated it as an optimization problem, but you, are, you know, just like in learning, optimization is not the goal per se here. Here, the goal is to infer the ground truth in the same sense that in learning, the goal is to minimize the test error, not really to minimize the value of the loss function. Uh, 
a note on if I only had the matrix or if I only had the tensor part in this model, these are both well-studied models in previous literature, and why I'm looking at the mixed matrix tensor version. It is because this one has interest in computation properties that allow us to pin down the constant differences between algorithms. But I guess this point will only become clear as I go on through the results. And the fourth point, mostly, is that in this model, we can describe the dynamics of the gradient descent in a solvable way. So how comes? This goes back to the statistical physics that was mentioned, where my background lies. And that's, you know, we can bring back the physics to this talk when we realize that the loss function that I have defined for the spike matrix tensor model Actually, by simply rewriting, I just redefine these constants uh, by some uh, scaling factors that just happen to be the ones commonly written uh, in this for, for this model in physics, and expand the squares in the loss function and just keep the cross terms because the other terms are constants. Uh, they do not depend on the variable x, either because they just don't, or because the norm of x was 1, because x lives on a sphere, so that also makes them constant. And I end up with this uh, function h of x. Minimization of this function is equivalent to minimization of the previous loss. And written like that, this is known as the Hamiltonian of a mixed two plus p spin spherical spin glass model in the physics literature. So don't worry if you don't know what that is, but if you come from the physics background, you will know. And with this, we can kind of now take the baggage of theoretical methods developed in statistical physics and use it. So use it to do what? So when we do inference, we need to define some estimators. So today I will be mostly, I will be focusing on the following two estimators. So one is the base optimal inference. That will be the best error on the X star that you can possibly make independently of algorithm. That you would manage to do if you were able to compute the marginals or in physics terms, the local magnetizations of the Boltzmann measure at temperature one. So Boltzmann measure is just exponential of beta times the loss function. And if you do something like Langevin algorithm sampling that aims at exactly that. And the other estimator I will be looking at is the maximum likelihood inference where you are computing, you know, in physics terms, the ground state where you're aiming to minimize this loss function. And gradient descent or flow aims exactly at that. So before going to the gradient descent, let me just tell you what we know about this model from the point of view of information theory and from the point of view of other analyzable algorithms that can be used to solve this inference problem. Because here I will not be claiming that gradient descent is the best, as you will see, but we use this as a point of comparison. So what we know about a model like that is based on uh, results from the statistical physics literature that in the paper that I'm citing about here, you know, can be proven. These are now uh, mathematical methods based on the interpolation uh, method that are, that are established in the recent years. So we have two kinds of results here. We have the information, we, we have this free entropy function that encodes two things. The optimal error that any possible algorithm could reach and that is given by the global maximum of this little function and the error of a specific algorithm, the approximate message passing that we can use to solve this problem. And that is also encoded as a maximum of this free entropy function, but the local maximum that is reached from small parameter m. And you know, I could have a talk on only about that, but this is kind of established these days. If you just collect this information, and go back to the model, I like to draw this kind of a phase diagram that tells us as a function of the parameters delta two, which was remember the noise that you put on the matrix when you are hiding the signal X star and delta P, which is the noise that you put on the tensor when you're hiding the signal X star. 
So when both delta 2 and both delta and delta p are very big, the problem is, of course, impossible to solve because you just completely hide the signal in the noise. And this, uh, this schema is telling you the values of these two parameters for which indeed information theoretically, you can obtain no correlation whatsoever. This parameter n is the correlation and it stays zero even for exponentially costly algorithms, whatever you do, that's the red region. Then there is the green region in which this approximate message passing algorithm is able to solve the problem optimally when the size of the system goes to infinity. And then there is this tricky orange region where this approximate message passing does not solve the problem, but information theoretically, it, was, it would be possible. And that's conjectured to be hard for all other polynomial algorithms. So we don't really expect gradient descent to work in that region. But now our question is, how does gradient descent compare to the approximate message passing and to the information theoretic limit? So to define what I mean by gradient descent, we will be actually analyzing the gradient flow algorithm. So all the time derivatives are continuous. That is defined here. Uh, the, the derivative of the estimator element x has three terms. There is the derivative of the loss function or the Hamiltonian in the middle. There is the weight decay. If you want to put it in our case, that this is a term used to enforce this constraint that the signal uh, lies on a sphere. And the third term that is a noise that for the gradient flow is not there, its variance t is equal to zero. And for the Langevin algorithm, the noise is there and this parameter t is equal to one. If I put the t equal to one, then I can prove that at exponentially large time in the size of the system, this algorithm is actually sampling the posterior measure. So it is computing the base optimal estimator. But that's not what I'm focusing on. I'm not really interested what happens at exponentially large sizes or uh, times. I'm interested what happens at tractable times. And in my case, this will simply be linear in the size of the system with maybe some log factors, but not more than that. That would be that would already take too long time for the kind of system sizes that we want to deal with. So when I define the gradient descent then how do I solve it? How do I find, how do I write some theory to actually uh, understand it? And this is where I again dig in the old statistical physics literature in the nineties and realize that for this two plus P spin mixed uh, spin glass, there is a very well-known paper in the literature on the behavior of glass systems by Julian de la that provides us with almost what we need. They, they describe the dynamics for a system that is very much this system. It's just that this signal X star that is planted in the tensor and in the matrix does not exist in, this, in the variant of the problem at which they are looking. But otherwise the method that they develop is exactly what we need. So in order to put that planted signal X star in, you need to work and reproduce that analysis. And it's, you know, it's, some, it's, it's some work, but it's relatively straightforward. There is nothing conceptually new uh, in it. And if you do it, you actually end up with this set of equations that surely look scary if you haven't seen them before that are called the dynamical mean field theory. If you want to see a detailed derivation of these equations, I gave here a link on a, le a lecture uh, given by Pierre Francesco Urbani this summer where he beautifully does the derivation in, in a two hour lecture with all the details. But here I will just kind of describe the form of these equations, what the dynamic mean field theory does. It takes the limit of the size of the system, the N, which remember was the dimensionality of the X over which we want to optimize to infinity. And from this non-convex high dimensional model, it reduces the error that the gradient descent is doing to a set of three equations for three variables, C, C bar and R, and the limit is already taken. So this is a scalar set of equations for three variables that depend on the times. And it's this kind of a set of differential integrable equations. So it's not that you can kind of solve them on a piece of papers, 
But the difficulty of the problem, which is the high dimensional, went away. The n is not there anymore. They are, this is already an effective dynamics in the limit when n is large. And also, you know, the high dimensionality also makes things algorithmically easy. So you can plug this quite simply to some numerical solvable of differential equations and, and solve these equations. So that's what we do. And okay, on, on the mathematical side, actually proving that this uh, scalar or low dimensional description of the high dimensional dynamics is correct, has been done for the original paper of Kuliandolo Kurchan uh, by colleagues Benarus, uh, Dembo, Gione, uh, some years ago already. For the version with the planted X star, it has not been done yet. So that's an open problem for, for those who, of you who want to take that challenge. But let me show you how the algorithm how the algorithm behaves. So in this picture, I am showing the correlation of what the algorithm sees at any given time with the signal X star it is looking for. And in the inset, I am showing you what happens for the approximate message passing algorithm, just for comparison. And the light gray curves are lower value of noise. So light gray should be easier. And that's what you see for the approximate message passing. The correlation for the light gray ones is higher and it happens so sooner. For the Langevin algorithm, on the other hand, the light gray ones, they reach eventually, when they go up, they reach higher co correlation. But what is counterintuitive is that it takes longer to actually start reaching good correlation. So that's something that, you know, why should you expect that? But the analysis tells us that this, this is what happens. And when you actually uh, extrapolate where it is time for the algorithm to reach even non-zero correlation diverges, you can draw the line uh, above which it, it works and below which it doesn't work into the phase diagram. So here, the green dotted line is a boundary above which the Langevin algorithm reaches optimal solution in uh, in lin log linear time and below which it doesn't. It just stays stuck at correlation with the signal that is zero, while the approximate message passing would find a good correlation. So this orange region, orange green region is the Langeva hard region. So here we see a specific difference between how the approximate message passing algorithm works and how the Langeva works. You can do exactly the same analysis for the gradient flow and you will get a boundary that is slightly higher. This is not so surprising that the maximum likelihood does worse than the base optimal, you know, than trying to sample the posterior measure because that's, that's the base optimal kind of estimator. And, but again, it doesn't do as well as, uh, as information theoretically it could. Now, how do we understand something like that? So a kind of popular explanation for something like gradient flow to fail in a highly non-convex, um, high dimensional problem is kind of sketched here that there are spurious local minima that just make you stuck and you don't go to the minimum to which you would like to go. So the brown minima here would be the spurious one, the blue one is the good one. And the kind of popular narrative is that you get stuck up there in the brown ones and you don't get to the blue ones. So this um, model that I'm studying is so simple that we can actually with advanced but you know doable methods such as the cuts rise approach in this case, compute exactly how many minima they are at a given value of an energy. And that's, you know, that's a result of the famous Katzreis formula, which again, I'm not giving here the details how you get to these, uh, to these equations and also don't expect you to understand the details. But this is just a formula that tells you what is the logarithm of the number of minima that are at a given parameter M that is the correlation with the ground truth at a given a cost E2 and EP where E2 relates to the matrix and EP relates to the order P tensor. And so from this formula, what we can extract is actually when there are spurious local minima and when there are no spurious local minima. And putting that result into the same phase diagram, I get the purple line. 
above the curb line, the only minima that I have is the signal, the one corresponding to the signal. Below, there are spurious local minima. So if that popular narrative was correct, that you know, it's about the spurious local minima, then the gradient flow line and the landscape trivialization line should be the same. But they are not. There is a gap between them. So what's going on? So in order to understand what's going on, we need to understand a bit more detail what the equations, the dynamic mean field theory is telling us about the behavior of the dynamics in this problem. And for that, we actually plot how uh, the correlation with the signal behaves as a function of time. And at the same time, how the value of the loss behaves as a function of time. And this is done in this figure. And you realize that actually the loss looks like it plateaus at a certain value. And then it either stays there or suddenly goes away. And that's at that point that the magnetization, the overlap, the correlation will start to grow. And the value at which the loss seems to plateau is actually something that, again, corresponds to something that has been described before and known in the literature as the threshold energy for even the model treated in the older Kuliandolo Kurchan works. So realizing that, you can actually write a, a, a derivation prescription of where the gradient descent should stop you say, okay, let's assume that the gradient descent goes to the threshold states. In the literature, you have conditioned for what needs to be true so that you're at those threshold states. And then at the threshold states, you can write a condition for whether or not they are stable or unstable towards the direction of the signal. That's the middle equation here. And then you just put these two together and that gives you the condition under which the gradient flow or Langevin algorithm, depending what you put for this parameter t here, zero or one, will work or not. So when you put these together, this leads you to the following conjecture that the gradient flow with random initialization finds the optimal correlation with the signal in time that is polylog linear in the size of the system, which in this case is n to the power p because the tensor has that many uh, different components for a value of the noise on the matrix that satisfies this condition and the contrary that it doesn't manage to do so if the noise is bigger than that. And if you actually plot these, uh, these expressions back again, oh, again the, the open problem now would be to prove it because uh, the, the, the level at which we came to this result is, uh, is, has some assumptions that are not fully rigorous. But it's a very you know, simple expression, closed form conjecture for where these uh, thresholds are. And when you plot them back into the phase diagrams, so that would be the blue line, you see that one agrees with the, with the black points. So that looks like the correct line, not the purple line. And the same for the Langev algorithm, that was actually the, uh, dashed, the dashed green line going through the points. And you can also correct in a cartoon this popular uh, explanation by realizing that the instability of the threshold states actually corresponds to uh, almost minima up at the cost up in the energy of the loss function. And what matters is whether those truly are minima or whether those actually have a negative direction towards the signal. And so what matters is the property of those high-lying minima rather than the existence of the spurious minima lower in the energy landscape where the gradient descent just actually doesn't even ever see them. It never goes close to them. So whether they are there or not, it doesn't hurt the algorithm. So that's the mechanism to actually be able to work even when spurious local minima do exist. And to somehow conclude this first part of the talk, uh, you know, I showed you the, the closed form conjecture for the threshold of the gradient and Langev gradient uh, flow and the Langev algorithm that sometimes works even when bad local minima exist. And these thresholds are, you know, include all the constants in these signal to noise ratios. And the question is, you know, is this applicable to some models that look more like a neural network? And the second point, I showed you that the gradient flow is worse than the Langev algorithm, but both are worse than the approximate message passing. And the question could be, how do we actually approach 
can we improve the performance? What do we do to improve the performance? And the third question, you know, can we say something about stochastic values? So now I just keep those green questions and show you actually our progress on the first two of them. So is this theory applicable to simple neural networks? And with that, I go to the second toy model that I promised, and that is the phase retrieval with input data that are IID Gaussians. So how is this defined? This is your know, phase retrieval is a problem that is studied in, in signal processing has wide, wide range of applications. But in the kind of toy setting that I consider here, I consider the input data X are just component wise Gaussians with zero mean and variance one over the dimension of the problem. Uh, P here will not be B. There is no tensor and it's order anymore. So here it's, uh, here it's uh, you know, standard kind of uh, generalized linear regression where P will be the dimensionality of the signal. And then the labels from the data X are created by taking the samples scalar product with some ground true weight vector if you want W star, that again, the W star is generated from a Gaussian, you take an absolute value, so you lose the sign and that's the labels. And then the phase retrieval problem is this following regression from the training data X and Y, can you find a W so that on new X you predict the correct Y. So this is more you know, in the setting of standard supervised uh, learning neural networks. And so far, there is no learning. So far, I'm just describing how I'm creating the data set. So this is a kind of, you can think of it as a teacher neural network that is creating the data set. And the absolute value is making it tricky. Otherwise, it would have been just linear regression as you know it. The absolute value is making it, you know, no, the data non-separable and that's what makes it interesting. So again, what do we know about a phase retrieval for Gaussian input data and the labels generated the way I did from the point of view of information theory and the approximate message passing algorithm that is conjectured to be the, the, the kind of best polynomial one for this problem. I again summarize it, summarize it in a kind of a phase diagram where on the y-axis is the error and on the, here I put the mean square error of estimation of W star, which is actually closely related to the test error in this case, but it's not exactly the same value. As a function of alpha, which is the number of samples per dimension. So this parameter alpha will appear a lot, is how many more samples I have per dimension. And the orange curve is the information theoretically best performance. So I need to have more samples than the dimension to be able to get zero generalization error in this case. That's an information theoretic result proven in before actually our work. The, the work that I'm citing here is a, um, a result for the uh, performance of the approximate message passing, which is the blue curve. So that's kind of our algorithm of reference to which we will be comparing that doesn't reach perfect generalization quite at alpha equal one, but does so at alpha equal 1.30. So soon after, not too, not too much after. So there is still a hard phase, but it's very narrow in this case. So we just need 13% more samples than the dimension to be able to solve this problem. And now let's go to the gradient descent. How does gradient descent do for, for, for this, phase retrieval. So first of all, what will be the loss function in which we will be looking at? That's you know, the natural loss function. Absolute value is complicated. So let's make it square and also square the labels and minimize the sum of uh, squared differences. That's kind of a natural loss function for this problem. Let's do it again with the gradient flow with random initialization. And how does this perform? So what do we know? So here I give kind of an axis where for reference, I put you the information theoretic threshold and the threshold reached by approximate message passing. And what is known about gradient descent in the literature is this paper that shows that if alpha is polylogarithmic in the dimension P, then gradient descent from random initialization is working. This is a huge gap between like 1 or 1.13 and polylog P, where P went to infinity. 
So the question is, okay, does it actually, the, the, the result of course is the positive side, not the converse. So the region in between is open. Does gradient work, uh, flow work there from random initialization or not? So let's look at that question. So first, let's look at it numerically. Let's just run gradient descent and plot the fraction of successes when it actually reaches zero, gen zero um, test error on the data on the data sets of the sizes that are specified in the key here. And we see that as the data sets are getting bigger, that you know, first of all, there is some kind of a change from zero fraction of success to one. As the data set is getting bigger and bigger, there is a slight shift to the right. So numerically, this could be compatible with the logarithmic shift, but it's, it could also be that the shift actually stops at even larger sizes that one cannot simulate so precisely to, ha to have a good statistics on the size. So, okay, so let's try to see whether we can look at this more theoretically, you kind know, of taking inspiration from the lessons we learned in the two plus P spin model. And um, in that model, we had this hypothesis on which the theory stands that the gradient flow goes first to the threshold states. And then is the kind of BBP-like instability of those threshold states leading to the signal that decides whether or not the gradient flow succeeds. So let's try to look at numerically whether this kind of hypothesis also seems to be valid in the phase retrieval. So, so if I run, so the two plots here, the one on the right shows us the value of the loss function if the labels were completely reshuffled. So there is no planted solution, there is no function to be learned. So that would be defining the threshold states, the, the energy of the threshold states. So I take them from the right hand side figure and I plot them in the left hand side figure, where is the value of the loss function for uh, the phase retrieval as I defined it. So there is a signal and if the if these curves go sharply to zero, well, it means that they found the signal and they found zero test error. So if you are at a very low alpha, so few samples, the red curves, you stay stuck at the threshold energy. And at some intermediate alpha, it seems like you converge to the threshold energy, you plateau, and then you go away. So it really does look as what we have seen before. So this hypothesis seems to be reasonable also here. So let's go with it and see what would follow from it. So there are uh, there is a literature from which we can extract the BBP type of transition for the kind of random matrices that appear in, in this problem. And that, that would provide us a formula for the threshold of the sample complexity in the alpha that would depend on the probability distribution, uh, on, on a certain probability distribution between the labels and some kind of pre-activation labels. So again, not really going into the details, but, but that's some kind of probability distribution that we can estimate again from the theory that follows that is known in the, in the literature on spin glasses using what's called one replica symmetry breaking theory which in this case happens to be an approximation. So this is some kind of approximation that we use to compute this probability distribution that in the figures here, we compare the moments of this probability distribution to the ones that we measure empirically by simply running the gradient descent. And you, know, you see that the points lie on the curves. So this approximation seems to be pretty good. So we go with that, seems reasonable. And if we go with that, we estimate that the gradient flow should start working in the um, phase retrieval problem, starting from alpha, number of samples divided by dimension, something like 14. So if I plot that back into my axis, we end up with this picture that the gradient descent in this problem numerically is compatible with the log shift. Maybe there is a threshold somewhere at seven. Our theory predicts a threshold at somewhere like 14. The precise content, constant is not clear to us as this theory was an approximation anyway. So here I would state the open problem much more mildly. It seems nevertheless that the logarithm of the dimension might not be needed. So can we improve 
for any constant, that constant times dimension uh, is samples is sufficient for the gradient flow to actually solve this problem in time that is size of the system times poly of, of the dimension. Seems that this should be true, but this is an open problem. Such a proof is not out there. But if you actually look at this figure, it should kind of strike you that the gap between what the gradient descent does and what is possible information theoretically or even algorithmically with the approximate message passing is quite big. And can we close that gap? How do we go about that? Is there, you know, other than running the approximate message passing? Because that's not a generic solution that we can do in this toy model, but that we cannot do for ImageNet, for instance. We don't know how to do that. So how do we close that gap in a way that we can kind of reproduce for other non-toy model data sets? And the answer for which I, I, I will argue in this talk, and that goes back to my second question here, is that if you overparameterize, that's precisely the mechanism that is doing that for us. So to persuade you of that, I still look at the phase retrieval in the same setting, is the same problem, but now the learning is different. Now I'm not learning as if I was doing generalized linear regression anymore. I am adding in one hidden layer that is very wide. That will be the parameter M is the width of the hidden layer. And I will need the width of the little hidden layer to be larger than, than the dimension for the results that I'm going to show you to be true. And then on this you know, wide single hidden layer uh, neural net, I'm just doing gradient flow initializing in the standard way. And so it's over parameterized neural net and how does gradient descent on that, arcade, on that cost function do in terms of the sample complexity. So to get to that, it's in a paper that we wrote uh, with Eric van den Eyden and, and my student uh, Stefano Sara Manelli, um, last summer. So we first so, show a geometric result. If you look at the landscape of this new cost function in a uh, parameter that is not quite the weights, but that is a matrix that is the weights times transpose of the matrix of the weights, so this parameter A. So if you look at the landscape in this parameter A, then we can prove that for alpha bigger than two, that is we need twice as many samples than the dimension, with positive probability, the ground true, the, 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 the teacher A is the only minimizer of that landscape. And if alpha is smaller than two, then with probability one, there are other minimizers of that landscape. So that's one theorem. And then you put it together with the theorem that is telling us that in this case, the gradient descent will go to a minimizer of this uh, loss landscape, which put together tells you that in this overparameterized neural network, gradient flow only needs twice as many samples than the dimension to work and to find perfect generalization. And actually the figure on the previous uh, slide was a numerical confirmation of, of that kind. But going back to my axis, you know, this is telling us that with overparameterization, the neural network in this very uh, setting needs way fewer samples to, to solve the problem, uh, notably two. Alpha needs to be two, but not quite 1.13. So that could kind of bring us to, to the two uh, following open questions. I start with the second one. So is there a neural network architecture for which the plane gradient descent would actually need even less than two P samples? We know that with the kind of fine-tuned approximate message passing, we only need 1.13. And also the other question, the, the, the first point here, because in, in the extremely overparameterized case where the hidden layer is larger than the dimension even, here, in a sense, I don't have spurious global minima anymore. Kind of the, I, I got rid of those by even by the, the structure of our proof. But if I went back to the regime where the size of the hidden layer is smaller than the dimension, but you know, not uh, one hidden unit, say five, 10, 100, or square root of the dimension or something like that, 
then I would bring back the spurious local minima, they would reappear. And it's an open question kind of when do they reappear and uh, when do they hurt the algorithm, the performance of the algorithm or not. <clears throat> Sorry, so that's a direction on which we are working. And I should be coming to the conclusion of my talk. So this third point where you would very naturally uh, ask what about the stochastic gradient descent, the multi-pass one, where you actually don't calculate the gradient descent, uh, the gradient with respect to the whole data set, but just uh, of uh, small batches of it. So that's actually um, something on which we worked and on which Francis Caminaco, my student, will tell you about in, in the next talk. And with this, I can just uh, give here the uh, references to the papers on which uh, this talk was based, including the one Francesca will tell you about, and open to the discussion. Thank you, Lenka. That was wonderful. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions from the Q&A which popped up. Um, so Reiner Engleken wants to know, is, is it possible to estimate finite size effects um, on the gradient flow? Um, possibly, I mean, that's definitely, yeah. that's, that's a very natural question. And uh, that's, that's, you know, once you understand well the limit in any case in physics, the finite size effects then are the next question. So I didn't really think about how difficult it's it won't be completely straightforward and easy, possibly. Okay. It's, a, it's an interesting direction in which, uh, you know, kind of one can, uh, th there is a physics literature on these type of equations and their finite size effects. So it's a good question to think which of them would apply and which of them would generalize to these cases. And I had a question sort of more generally about, um, gradient descent or grain flow algorithms in the AMP and could you maybe give us some intuition under what circumstances AMP apparently this has this magical performance where it's so close to threshold and when it will break down and be closer to gradient based algorithms? So the, okay, so, so so the kind of difference of why, you know, why in deep learning we use gradient-based algorithms and not AMP is that AMP is very sensitive to the assumptions or that we make when we write the model. So for instance, this property that the input data are Gaussian. I mean, you know, proving it for non-Gaussian input data, what we did is challenging. I, you know, I don't know how I would go about it, but it's might be possible and definitely it's not bothering the gradient descent very much, the algorithm. I mean, empirically, we know that it does not, but the, the message, the approximate message passing type of algorithms, it is definitely bothered by the mismatch of these assumptions. So there are versions of it that are less bothered by mismatch of the assumptions, but you know, it's, it's kind of this lack of robustness, the, the lack of kind of being still a provably good algorithm beyond kind of assumptions of the toy model. So this is why these type of algorithms, you know, are not like widely deployed on, on real, on real uh, data, you know, on real data, at least so far. So here we are really using it as a kind of theoretic, you know, I think about it as a kind of point of reference from the point of view of kind of what is theoretically, from the computation complexity point of view, what is theoretically achievable. We don't believe that in the cases for which these algorithms are well suited, the conjecture that they are the best polynomial ones is kind of very solid. So I use it here as a kind of surrogate for what is computationally achievable with respect to what is information theoretically achievable. So I don't really expect them to get worse for other reasons than, you know, the, the data are not anymore respecting the assumptions that the theorems needs them to respect. I see. And in applying them to sort of more practical, realistic problems, the, what do you think is the, the main thing which violates the assumptions when AMP will work well? 
Yeah, so that would be that's a that's a very important question. That would be like for a separate talk, basically how to you know the path kind of to make these uh, message passing based algorithms uh, good enough to be to be used in practice. And you know, don't take me wrong. There are many applications in say signal processing where where they actually do really well. For instance, in applications where you can design the analog of the input data, such as the error correcting codes, where kind of the design of the code corresponds to designing your data, you know, it doesn't come from the real world, it's something that you can design, then you can ensure that uh, the code actually has those properties. And, you know, some types of message passing algorithms are used in your, in your uh, phone to, to correct for errors. So definitely in cases where you can kind of design the matrix, the analog of the matrix A so that it satisfies the properties, these are like super interesting applications. That would be for not even like one talk kind of the, the boundary of where these, you know, where we hope these can be useful one day. I would hope even like in deep learning, they can be maybe used and used for one day, but we are not there yet. Like replacing the gradient descent by message passing, that would be nice, but yeah, that's, yeah, super. that's, that's, that's right. more like in the, yeah. in the, like, you know, you need to have a hope to work on it, but we are not yet there. Okay, um, great. Um, so I think we don't have any other questions in Q and A. Yeah. So uh, two, I think. I think, Renee, uh, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, thank you, Lenka, for a great talk. Um, I really was trying to understand maybe a little bit better the first part. Uh, in your diagrams that had the delta 2 and the delta p, um, I was uh, a little bit surprised that it appears to be that the problem is harder on the delta 2 space than on the delta p. and and. I wanted to understand at an intuitive level why there is an asymmetry. And it also seemed, or at least you didn't emphasize whether there is any role of P as to whether uh, it changes or the problem becomes more complex as I change P. Yes. So, so the second part of the question with the change of P, uh, so yes, we, we have these uh, diagrams also for P equal 4 and 6 and 10. I, I, if I remember correctly in the paper. So it looks qualitatively a little bit different. Um, I, I, I don't have it like in, in a backup slides, but yes, P influences it, but it influences the shape of the Langevin heart face in this slide that I'm going back. Uh, it also, you know, otherwise like the features that uh, when you're changing, uh, that it becomes actually harder so I guess the first part of your question, did I understand it well? Because what is kind of counterintuitive here is that the delta P is a noise, right? So smaller delta P is smaller noise. So smaller noise should make things easier, whereas here it is making things harder. So that was exactly the point of kind of the first evaluation graph that I was showing that indeed, you know, for the gradient flow or the Langevin, as you are making the noise on the tensor smaller, you are in a sense enhancing the non-convex part of the loss landscape. And you know, despite the intuition that making small the noise smaller is making it easier, you are actually making it more non-convex. And this is what hurts the algorithm more than actually having smaller noise in the kind of information theoretic sense. So Okay, that's that's kind of how to understand that it's not you know completely not impossible that it goes in this direction. It's kind of making the non-convexity much more pronounced. So that's what uh, makes it fail. Did I was there part of your question that I didn't answer? Maybe. No, no, that was that was great. Then the second one was mostly a clarification uh, for the second part of your talk. Uh, the Phase retrieval is, in principle, an imaging reconstruction problem, not necessarily a machine learning problem. However, your results were all speaking about generalization, as if it was a machine learning problem. So uh, yes. I, I, I had a disconnect there as to what the results meant uh, yeah. for phase retrieval. Yeah. So 
two ways to answer that. So either you forget about the original motivation for phase retrieval and view it as a toy model for supervised learning where you are just by definition interested in the generalization. That's one way to answer. Another way to answer if you don't want to forget about the original motivation and then what you care about is not the test error but is the reconstruction of the W star because that is the signal that you care about then you can still see this kind of uh, result. You, you could use it to enhance your reconstruction in the following way. If you actually can get zero test error, then you could basically, without measuring new measurements, computationally get the measurements for new samples and then computationally kind of be at much higher sample complexity than you actually are from what you have measured in your, I don't know, you know, medical imaging or whatever. And then you would just make it computationally much easier. So if you could solve phase retrieval as the machine learning problem, you could also solve it as the, as the signal reconstruction problem by the traditional signal reconstruction problems, because the machine learning way of solving it, would you provide the measurements Y for free in a sense? So, but okay, I, I mean, that's just like if you, if, if in the mind of theoretician, you want to make a piece that it's not completely artificial. I don't know whether that would be like an interesting practical way to actually do it. But yes, there are these two ways to look at it as, you know, either you want the W star or you want the predict new Y's for new axes. And they are kind of both interesting. Thanks. Um, Great. Do any of the other panelists have questions they want to ask? Oh. Hey, thanks. Thanks also uh, for, yeah, thanks for that amazing doc. Um, I had a question kind of at a very high level of modeling the dynamics of learning um, as a dynamical system and, and whether or not, you know, these types of physics statistical mechanics based models have a connection to you know, some of the other models that come up through like NTK, you know, the neural tangent kernel, and if there's any kind of interesting connection there, or if they, if they're fundamentally different in their assumptions. So, well, NTK is in essence a mapping to bring everything back to, to just linear regression. So, so I would, so, so in that sense, the answer would be, you know, you know, in general, maybe, but with NTK, you know, I'm not, I'm not making any transformation with the system here that is bringing it back to linear regression in some like particular feature space. I'm really kind of hitting the non-convexity in, in the hard way here. So I kind of believe that, you know, NTK gives you like a great set of intuitions about what learning is. But you know, it, it, it gives you only certain type of results. It's, it's not kind of explaining why for the networks that are not in the lazy regime, the gradient, uh, the, gradient the, the back propagation works, right? And the practical, maybe some practical problems are in the lazy regimes. Most of, you know, I believe that most of them are not. And there are papers in both directions, a lot of them in the recent years. So, you know, I, I think on a, you know, you went broadly. So if you really go at it broadly, understanding non-convex optimization is important because besides deep learning, there are many other non-convex optimization problems. And I don't believe that we will solve all of them by bringing them to some, you know, convex equivalent like you do in NTK. So I believe that this is kind of path that we cannot avoid. Thank you. Um, since we are at the big level, maybe I'll just squeeze one last question in, and that has to do with, so for example, when you, um, the insights which the community has gained from say Langevin dynamics on say the P-spin model in high dimensions and how it's easy to get to the threshold states and anything else takes a long time. Um, how would you say those insights guide slash are very different from what we have observed from SGD on toy problems. 
high dimensional type problems in machine learning. So, so you're asking about the difference between Langevin and SGD, basically? Basically in high dimensional rough landscapes. Yeah, so, so that's a great question that Francesca will touch on in her next talk and that she's, she's working you know, actively these days. So there are some results in making that, you know, maybe at the next uh, deep math conference we can present. But yeah, that's a, that's a super, that's a, you know, I find that a very important question in a sense formulated differently, like what's the difference between the nature of the noise in the SGD with respect to the Langevin? And there have been papers on that question in the past, and I'm sure other people are working on it. But again, it's one of these questions where you know the, the kind of satisfactory answer is not there yet. So yeah, I mean that's an important question to work on. Yeah. Well, um with that, thank you, Lenka, for this very stimulating talk. And uh, I think it's a nice um, lead into um, Francesca's talk.